Well, welcome back, everybody, to, uh, to this session. It's going to be a, a panel discussion uh, looking at uh, the issue of skills uh, and upskilling for Industry 4.0. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, four, four panelists from various uh, aspects and, and, and interests within the skills area. I'll ask them to, to go down the line and introduce themselves a bit about uh, what, the, what their interest level is in, in skills, what their, the relevance is to, to the roles that they play. So I'd like to kick us off. Yeah. My name is uh, Graham Bond from a company called FDM Digital based up in Burnley. We are a production additive manufacturing company um, working predominantly in the aerospace, Formula One and um, automotive sector. We're trying to work with um, education to upskill and reskill uh, future generations. Uh, we've got the knowledge and we need to pass it down the line. So we're working closely with Manchester Net on this. Hi, I'm Alan Parry and I'm a master's student at Manchester Metropolitan University on the Industrial Digitalisation Programme. So I've done some work with Autodesk as a student ambassador and an ambassador for Create Education as well. So I've done a bit of work with industry and I've had the full potential of kind of bridging the gap between education and industry. So my personal background is product design, so that's kind of my standpoint. Hi, uh, my name is Carl Diver. I'm the academic lead uh, for Industry 4 at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, previously, I'd worked uh, in industry in the automotive sector on diesel fuel injection systems. And uh, yet the role really at the moment is uh, driving Industry 4 within the university, but also engaging with industry and showing that our doors are open to engage and collaborate. Hi, my name is uh, Steve Parkinson. I'm UK Education Manager for Autodesk. Uh, Autodesk is a company who makes software for people who design and make things. Uh, my role in the UK is looking after all education engagements, which mainly uh, includes me working with some fantastic universities like Manchester Metropolitan University and some fantastic students like Ellen. Great, thank you very much. So I think if you kick us off with uh, perhaps your, your perspectives on uh, the skills landscape. So what, what you know, what perhaps uh, both from the, the industry uh, partners here as well, to, if you can sort of give us a feeling for what is the skills challenge? What, what, what are you trying to overcome and, and how, are you, how are you trying to do that? Graham, do you want to yeah, okay. kick us off? Um, yeah. So from our point of view, um, manufacturing, there's a, there's a massive skills gap. Um, what we are trying to um, understand is where the, the missing um, skills are and then use um, the old engineering approach which is uh, teach the students a lot of different modules about Industry 4, um, giving them a, an awareness of all the technologies out there so they can then, then progress through a, an MSc level and then end up in industry with the, the right knowledge and qualifications that, that employers are looking for. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time working with, uh, with universities and, and one of the programs that we've got um, at, uh, w well, we support Autodesk is the Future of British Manufacturing Initiative, uh, which is essentially trying to uh, bridge the gap between industry and education. Um, and specifically, I'm passionate about young people in education, uh, digital catalysts, uh, digital natives who know a world or don't know a world without uh, digital, and placing them in industry which have perhaps quite traditional workflows um, and are quite open to looking at new ways in which things like Industry 4.0 can be applied to, uh, to what they're currently doing. And I think one of the interesting things is, you know, working with students now, uh, in 2019, I'm seeing a lot now who just don't know a world without digital, and they've got an awful lot to offer uh, established companies and, and new companies who are looking to do things a little bit differently. Okay. Right. I think maybe just picking up on yeah, that. A bit. So I think that collaboration with Autodesk, I think uh, a good example is what we're doing on the MSc in industrial digitalization through Print City. That collaboration with you guys where you're coming in, you're uh, working with us on case studies, uh, but we're also working with you on the uh, uh, your Fusion 316 generative design. But the aspect of that MSc having uh, a really multidisciplinary number or cohort of students in there from business, from uh, animation, from product design, both product design, I guess, in an engineering sense, but product design from, from an art perspective as well. I, th I think it's, it's working quite well, isn't it? Definitely. I think what we've, got at, what we've got with Print City and the master's qualification in industrial digitalization is uh, this collision of all different people from different types of educational backgrounds from subjects, as, as Carl just mentioned there. And I think this is a real opportunity um, 
we've got a lot of, the stand over there says future disruptors, and that's exactly how I see them. And that sort of qualification that's coming out from, uh, from MMU is, is certainly uh, catalyzing that whole process. Yeah. And it's something we're trying to build on. Uh, so we're launching a new Industry 4 MSCs in the School of Engineering. Uh, and collaborating with companies around that as well. So from a content point of view, so this aspect of getting, making sure we've got good industry engagement, getting uh, industry professionals to come in nearly on a weekly basis to talk to the students, uh, give real case studies, working on real live projects as well, uh, pushing internships as well, that aspect. So it's key, I think, getting that, uh, that collaboration going. So. Yeah, Excellent. can I just answer that from a student's point of view? So I was actually invited to attend the industrial advisory panel to put the yep. master's program together. And from a student perspective, that's really important to kind of see it's concrete evidence that industry are asking for these skills. And in the past, I've struggled to know what kind of skills would make me more employable. But hearing it directly from, from these industries, it's really, really helpful for me to lay out exactly what I need to get from my master's qualification. Uh, Ellen, perhaps you could give us a, a, a your journey, because I know you didn't start necessarily in, in the world of digitalization. I think no. it's quite an interesting thing for the, for the audience to hear. So my undergraduate degree was from Manchester School of Art in three-dimensional design. So it's quite a craft-based course. Um, I used a lot of traditional methods like woodworking, ceramics, um, glass blowing. So from there, I kind of got introduced to Print City and saw the opportunities for digital. And as soon as I started spending some time in Print City, I saw the potential for innovation if we use this technology. So from that point, I kind of got fully engaged in everything that Print City was doing. I met Autodesk. I got invited out to compete in uh, International Design Slam. Um, I've traveled to conferences in Las Vegas, uh, Birmingham, London. I've been all over the place doing all this work. And it's really exciting to just see the impact that this technology can have. But also having my background in these traditional manufacturing methods has kind of enhanced things a little bit more. I've got a wider understanding and I can see gaps for innovation and see how things work well together. Because it's not always the most efficient way to manuf manufacture things digitally with 3D print. So having that knowledge enables me to kind of see the difference and see where it's really beneficial. Did you also mention uh, your time in Vegas on that? Uh, yeah, so I was an international student ambassador in Las Vegas, where again I got to network with a whole range of companies and mentor a student team of ambassadors who are competing in the design competition. So all of this, I mean, it's really great experience for professional skills, but also soft skills for presenting, for leadership, for mentoring people, bringing groups together and kind of giving some direction. So. This collaboration has given me a whole range of skills, not just academic and not just kind of study-based. So it's really helped me. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I've got some questions on the app. I should have said at the beginning, um, using the Slido app, uh, please, you know, you can put your questions into your into your phones. They'll come up uh, and on the screen, and we'll be able to uh, to, to put them to the to the panel. Um, so first one I've got at the top here is, are college and university curriculums evolving quick enough for industry? Carl, that seems so to be yep, one you might uh, want to Let answer. me take that one then. Uh, so again, I guess going back to the industrial digitalization MSc, that was uh, turned around relatively quickly, uh, I think within nine months to a year, uh, where that course was put together. Um, so I think that was a good example of actually identifying that there was a need for a course like this. It was the first of its kind in the UK. Uh, and then actually getting around and implementing it. And that's something I've seen. Uh, so I've joined uh, ManMet about eight months ago. And there's what I'm seeing along the corridors. There's a lot of positivity and a can-do attitude of, uh, if we want to do something, let's, let's get on board and do it. And Industry 4 is a key strategy of the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Yep. But it's also been adopted across the university. Um, so the MSc in Industrial Digitalization is one example. Um, We've also decided to relaunch our MSCs uh, in the School of Engineering around a kind of an industry four suite of MSCs, so a mechanical engineering stream, an electrical engineering stream, and project management. Again, that's been turned around quite quickly, uh, probably in the last year and a half, uh, and we'll start in September 2019. And on that aspect, we're really listening to industry. We're uh, collaborating quite closely. Uh, our industrial advisory boards, and uh, we're trying to revamp those as well. We're bringing uh, large companies in, uh, we're bringing small companies, SMEs and startups in uh, to try and understand what are their challenges, what kind of aspects are they looking for in graduates, and then trying to see how can we implement that and embed that in our courses. And then we want to be flexible in that and how we deliver that. And so aspects like live projects, 
uh, interns, uh, placements, uh, again, that aspect of case studies and getting the companies to come in and talk to the students about real issues and inspiring the students to see, well, this is what you would be doing uh, in the real world. Right. You know, so you're so breaking down what traditional uh, structures of, of, of the way courses would be offered and, and being flexible about how you yeah, modularize um, them. Do you, and, and, uh, you were mentioning to me also uh, when we were talking the other day about condensing courses or making them more flexible to suit the needs of people who are working and, and yeah. studying? So in talking to industry as well, we're seeing there uh, one aspect is that there's a, maybe a generational gap from the digital point of view. So uh, I think you mentioned about you know, the, the younger generation coming through with you know, digital is just second nature to them. But when you've had people in organizations for quite a long period of time, uh, there's a challenge or maybe uh, an apprehension of embracing digital technologies. Um, so we're we're starting to see companies coming back and saying, what can you offer uh, our existing staff? So maybe short-term courses. Uh, we've got part-time engineering courses that we're running. Uh, we're looking at uh, Bachelor of Science courses that we can condense and run over two years. So you, rather than having the traditional summer break, um, use the, that three or four months and actually teach during that period of time so people can actually get in, get uh, their degree within two years. Uh, there's degree apprenticeships. We're one of the leading institutions in uh, degree apprenticeships uh, in the UK. I think one in ten degree apprenticeships are coming through ManMet. Uh, so again, listening to what industry is looking for and seeing what we can do to, to try and meet those needs. Um, and another challenge we're starting to see as well is around industrial placement. So when, when students come to us uh, for their undergraduate degree, uh, one of the questions we get asked is industrial placement and opportunity. Uh, and it's one of the things that when they come around with their parents, there's a real drive and it's something we offer and it's optional. Uh, but once they get into the system, uh, the, that desire, then there's a view of, no, I just want to get through my three years and finish uh, yeah. and I want to remain with the cohort I joined with. Uh, so there's a challenge there for us now of uh, getting our industrial advisory boards and industry to really engage and try and offer those opportunities for those students on the way through. And then when they come back in their final year, that experience from having worked in industry uh, will really benefit them in their final year projects. Okay. Thank you. Um, interesting question here. How do you define skills for Industry 4.0? And maybe that's a question, for the, again, for the industry members of the panel. What, what do you mean by skills? How do you, how do you encapsulate what, what that means concretely for those who are going to deliver the provision for those skills? It's interesting. For this, my, my answer would sort of blend into the, to the last question also, in that, you know, what, what, is, what is skills? It, so, for example, mechanic, our college and university curriculum is evolving. Well, I would say no, uh, in a majority. So I go to a lot of uh, universities where mechanical engineering is that sort of flagship project for potentially the sorts of uh, industries that are here visiting today. Uh, and I ask them questions like, you know, have you ever explored a, anything to do with electronics? No. Uh, are you doing anything digital? No. But then I sp spoke to a colleague last week in Barcelona who was working with Airbus. And on their program for skills, so someone who wants to do something like similar to Autodesk, you want to be a, uh, you want to work in CAD. They would take somebody, employ them, and train them for four years. So really, d is that a skill that you can teach at university? Or is it something where you have to give them the breadth and the tools to be able to explore? Um, and then the actual skill is, you know, do you want somebody who can use a tool or do you want somebody who can self-select tools to solve a particular problem? So I think it's quite a difficult one to answer that. Um, but I think skills for Industry 4.0 are, I think we need people who are more open-minded, uh, who have got an uh, experience of a breadth of different uh, technologies there to be able to go into uh, industry and suggest something a little bit different uh, to try and break some of these... Uh, really ingrained workflows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's something I think we see you know, at that point around you know, final year projects, group projects for mechanical engineers. You have a group of five mechanical engineers working together. And that won't happen in industry traditionally. You will have your electronics. and you know, So it's that aspect of trying to make sure we're starting to embed some of that. Uh, within those courses so that they're starting to get those multidisciplinary skill sets in. Yeah, and that's the great example with the MSc that Ellen's on at the moment is, you know, Ellen's maybe not going to be an electrical engineer, but she's aware of electronics and she's aware of how that can fit in. And she doesn't work in silo, she works in teams and she looks to work with other people and collaborate. And I think those sorts of things are, uh, are maybe not a skill but they're what you need to be able to, to move things forward and certainly, you know, 
push technology in that respect. So I think it's, it's a bro broader set of skills than just technical skills. It, it's it's more creative skills, I guess, Alan. Yeah. That's that's a world you've, 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 you've yeah. come from. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And having the opportunity to chat with different people. So on my course, we've got people from animation, from textiles, from dental, from healthcare, all these different sectors. So to have discussions, we have a Monday morning meeting. Every Monday, we talk about new things in the industry. So everybody brings something from a completely different background. And really quickly, you start to get a really broad knowledge of all the different things going on in industry four. Because it's so hard for me to kind of get a broad understanding of everything because it's such a big subject. But just knowing enough to kind of have an overview and then knowing your area in depth, that's really beneficial to me to understand the the wider skill set right. of industry for. Excellent. Graham, you want to make a, a um, comment? Yeah, I just want to echo that because you need you need the basic understanding of um, CNC technology, um, whether it's laser cutting, programming, CAD. Um, you'll need to understand traditional skills alongside new skills. And if you create a module course where, like Ellen says, you've got um, an under basic understanding of everything, when you go into your industry placement, you can at least apply that into uh, what the role is you are going into. And then from that, you can actually then develop your own career with inside that industry partner, then come back to university to maybe to finish off. I think it's, it's key to, uh, for skills to have not a, a limit. You just need to learn as much as you can from um, the experts around you. And I think probably leading on from some of those soft skills, uh, I think the example today where we have 10 of the students on that MSc from industrial digitalization in, in the back corner, uh, you know, the engagement that they've had in actually getting the stand set up, uh, preparing the literature that they need for that, uh, preparing the, the items that they have on display. So that, that idea of actually we've got a deadline, we need to, uh, to meet that. Uh, and then those soft skills of actually interacting and uh, telling people about what those products are, you know, what they're doing, what their, uh, their aspirations are. So I think it's providing more opportunities like that. Um, and also I think the competition side of things. So, so again, Ellen's had quite, a, quite an experience of different competitions and again today, uh, the Digital Innovation Challenge. So uh, we'll see what happens at 4.45. So <laughs> keep fingers crossed there. But um, it's that aspect of uh, the benefit that that brings and the focus that being involved in a competition like that can can bring out. So I have the PhD students from the past who've been involved in Siemens competitions at the Hanover Messe, uh, and they've won that, but you know the confidence they come back with and the other skill sets that they had to develop around preparing for that competition then. You know, so I think it's that adaptability and flexibility as well that we need to try and embed. So is some of this uh, sort of creating not, not, not skills that are needed specifically in Industry 4.0, I guess, but in, in how to operate in a team, in a company, in a complex environment, how to solve problems, how to, uh, how, how to learn new things, uh, kind of through experience and to a degree and, and, and on the job. Is that... Is yeah, I think so. There's that aspect of, you know, we're talking about, you know, better communication, collaboration, understanding and making decisions based on, on data. Um, so I think that aspect of it, of being flexible and being able to adapt as, as you move through your career is, is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get Graham's mic on? <laughs> no, we've lost you, Graham. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have we got a handheld mic? Um, yeah, so I was just going to uh, carry on from that. Basically, when uh, what I've seen from uh, students going into industry is also is that they, um, the industry also isn't ready for them sometimes. So they're going in ahead of the curve. So they then have to um, develop their own skill set and change the management inside the business. So there's a lot of big companies that we work with that are not ready for the level of students at MSc level that are coming out. So there's a, a change needs to be done within the companies ready to receive them. That's an interesting yeah. point, isn't it? The, the, the partnership that's required. To, it, it's not the, the responsibility doesn't fall only on educators or only on industry or only on government. But, but uh, at school level, there's a kind of a partnership required, and that, that seems to be what you're describing. Yeah, working for you. I think it goes back to that multidisciplinary nature again. So it's it's new business models as well that we're seeing. So you know. Uh, are you a company making X or are you selling a service? And it's, there's that aspect that starts coming into it and it, then it changes how we're thinking about things and how, 
what is it that we're selling and what solution are we providing. So I think that's one aspect that's, uh, that's key. Um, the other thing I think that, uh, so we had an industry four board uh, that we've established in the Northwest. So we had a meeting earlier and within that we had representatives from academia from uh, across the Northwest, uh, the Greater Manchester Chamber, uh, some of the local authorities, uh, companies, and again, it's getting all of those people in the room and actually talking about, you know, well, what is the need? How, how do we reach some of those SMEs that maybe don't have the time to come here today? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we start telling them about, you know, some of these technologies or, or skill sets or the opportunities that exist? And uh, so there's a challenge there, but we're trying to embrace it here in the Northwest. But it's, it's bringing everyone together again and, and those communication and collaboration possibilities. So. Yeah, uh, and that leads on to, I think, to this, this, the top question we have here, which is what vocational training is available to training good existing manufacturing engineers that are progressing in, in an industry for environment? So we, we often talk about universities of, of where 18-year-olds are coming in, uh, but that, what else is there out there, whether it's at university level or outside, and, and everybody's experience here would be, be valid in, uh, there's going to be lots of people in the audience who have current employees who they may wish to you know, upskill, Reskill, embellish what, what their knowledge and their, or, or even update to because what can be sometimes fast-moving technology changes need people to refresh their knowledge. What, what, what's Think your experience? Ellen, of what's out there? Well, you've been doing work in uh, local schools as well, haven't you? And yeah. Maybe it's something you picked up on uh, what experience you've had from that, maybe. Yeah. So, attending exhibitions and conferences and doing some work with primary schools and secondary schools, and just giving them the opportunity to kind of see what's available and see what they can do with the technology is really, really useful. Because I find that often they go in just quite uninterested and then by the time that they leave, they've s created something or they've seen something been made in such a small amount of time and they can instantly see the potential for it and they can see that it's possible to do these things and make them quite quickly. So that kind of sparks an interest and then they come back and then we've done some workshops at Prince City. We're getting schools involved coming to see us and coming to engage with what we're doing. And the interest level is huge. People go away really excited about the future of what they can do and how they can make an impact, really. Yep. So I think it's just reaching everybody and just showing potential. Because there's a lot, of, a lot of terminology, a lot of things around this industry that makes it quite difficult for some people to understand. So actually getting it in an accessible form and having something as simple as creating wheels for a racing car, where anybody can see that quick process to make something. Yeah, so just providing, providing those opportunities, really, getting people to understand what's capable. So, so based on that, um, what we think is missing as well is uh, like real-world demonstrators for industry sectors, so um, people can come in and understand how technology is applied to, say, a wing or a Formula One car or a, I don't know, some kind of equipment that you're in, you've got in industry automation. I think there's a, a distinct lack of that kind of um, thing in the Northwest. And I think it's UK-wide, it's not just in the Northwest. Uh, hopefully things like Made Smarter and uh, certain initiatives that we can see are going to start um, putting real world out there for people to go and see and understand and then start working out what skills they actually need to, uh, to upskill their own levels. I think that ties in with the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund uh, to try and make UK manufacturing smarter. So the Made Smarter pilot in the Northwest where you're engaging with SMEs at the moment, uh, it's trying to build on that but it's, it's then those yeah, I think it's key, those live demonstrators where people can actually come in and see things and actually uh, get a feel for what it really looks like and what it could mean for them as a company. So mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important. I think so, some of what we've just talked about there is, is the kind of the inspirational and the what's out there, what's the art of the possible, mm -hmm. what could I be trying to achieve? W once you've been convinced by that, though, what, what's the, the concrete training or the education that, that's available to someone who's perhaps in their 50s, has, has been a, an engineer for quite a long time, has seen these technological changes and therefore needs some, some additional formal training or education. It, it, is that, is that lifelong learning? Is that still provided at university level? Or Steve, have you seen that in your own business? No, it's, it's, it's interesting. Last week I saw a slide. Um, and, you know, at Autodesk we've br bringing out new Tech, new technology for um, for a, a modern engineer, shall we say? And one of the graphs I saw last week was the difference between somebody learning a software piece of software we've got, which is four years old, 
uh, YouTube views, uh, YouTube subscribers, sorry, we had 120,000 versus a potentially com com competitive piece of software, which has been around for 20 years, uh, and that was down to 18,000 subscribers. So the way people learn is, is obviously different. So for someone who's 50 versus someone who's uh, 20, 25, um, it, it is different. But back to that question there, what I do see, is, which is quite unique, what is happening at Print City is they have got industry coming in for consultation opportunities, showing them the technology that's available and how they could potentially apply that to their existing workflows and industry. In the same building, you've got students who are on undergraduate qualifications, master's qualifications, a PhD. So you've got this, not only have you got different skills, you've got different people from different educational um, backgrounds. And that way of learning is, is, is very much changing. And that element of vocational training of, yeah, once upon a time, and I still think this is very important, I can see the T levels on there as well, being able to learn a particular skill thoroughly is, is extremely important, but also the way of learning of being able to think, right, actually that's something I need to learn and, and going away and doing that yourself is also something which is emerging with this, uh, uh, these digital natives which we spoke about also. Great. Okay. So I, I like this question. If you were 16 to 18 yourself now, um, what would you choose to do if you knew that you wanted to be an industry expert? So you, I guess that's you're coming towards the end of your school part. What route do you choose and, and where, where do you find that? Who wants to imagine that they were 16 again? It's not too far for some people. But <laughs> <laughs> Am I the oldest further. on the panel? Will I, <laughs> um, I mean, I've got the uh, experience of my, my son who's just he's 16 leaving school this year. Um, he's now looking to do engineering um, at Blackpool Power College. They've got you know, an, an, an area where he can go and learn robotics, 3D printing, laser scanning. I mean, I wish I was 16 to 18 again to have all them toys to play with because we didn't have a lot at college when we were there. So if I was going to do it, I would just learn as much as I could while I had the opportunity to, and then you never know when you're going to need it. It's very similar to a, the old HNC BTEC engineering course where you learn all the modules You've got them in, in your head, and it's just whether you choose to apply them later down the line. I think that aspect as well now of you know, that additive gives you to actually make things. So I see with my own kids that you know, they, they see something, they want something made, then we can just you know, make a model and have it printed the next day, and I come home with it, and you know, there you go. And so that things can be created quite quickly and realized quite quickly. So, uh, so I think uh, engineering and, you know, the industrial side is becoming a lot more uh, attractive now than it, than it did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So, and I think we're seeing more people coming in. Uh, maybe you would have gone down maybe a digital route before, uh, maybe more computer science, but actually now diverting maybe more towards engineering courses because you're bringing those two worlds together, and they're used to the apps and the interactive displays and things like that. So, so, and it, I think it's it's helping. And the other thing we're doing in, in Manchester Met is opening up the workshops. So, you know, the other day we needed uh, something turned around in a couple of hours. You were able to go up to the uh, to the blue room on the third floor and access, like, the laser cutters in there. We've got, you know, band cells. We've got some of the traditional machinery as well uh, that you need alongside the, uh, the additive machinery. But we allow the students to get in there and actually get hands-on. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always a technician in supervising, but... Uh, but they're actually allowed to, uh, to get hands-on in, in, in that environment. And then th that... I guess is more creative then as well. It's still on that question, um, I'd almost want to scrub out the 18, 16 to <coughs> 18 and you know, go no. 8 to 12 <laughs> yeah. because I think the, there's a big problem. I mean, prior to joining Autodesk, I was a vice principal of a UTC, so secondary school, and I was a design and technology uh, teacher for 10 years. And um, that subject in itself is, is a bit of a mess. Um, you know, what's been taught and, and learned no, through no fault of anybody is not fit for purpose in the 21st century, let alone 2019 and Industry 4.0. So the engagements of people here from industry, Manchester Met, going into secondary schools, I think to be able to inspire somebody so that they're actually still interested at 16 to 18 uh, is, is very, very important. And I think we're losing, well, we're hemorrhaging um, potential engineers and students and people who are fit for an Industry 4.0 workforce um, well before they even get there, unfortunately. It, it's something we're trying to do through this Industry 4 board as well, is to actually make sure we include you know, the, the colleges and the, the secondary schools and primary schools in that discussion as well, and not just the, the universities in the region. Yeah. 
Good. So uh, you mentioned tea levels earlier, and it, it, there's a question here as well that mentions tea levels. How, how does the panel see future skills and the skills gap being impacted by tea levels and degree apprenticeships? And, and we may need uh, some description of what tea levels actually are uh, before we go into that. So who wants to take that? Okay, the TRL levels, is that what we're... Okay. T, no, t, I think T levels as in educational T levels. Yes, yeah, so the new T levels are going to come in and sit along our traditional academic A levels. Um, and actually my colleague from Autodesk is on the uh, panel for digital engineering. And yeah, the, the, I mean, unfortunately, we're not long since the diploma, uh, which obviously tried to combat this. I've seen the T levels and the one specific to en engineering in our industry. I'm, you know, I'm very, very optimistic about it. But one of the key things here is what they call a work placement. And typically a work placement is, say for example, we all think in what's work placement, it's two weeks in industry, you go in and get a bit of experience. The work placement with the new T-levels is, is, is uh, the equivalent of um, 45 weeks. So, so where does that come from? Uh, sorry, f f 45 days, where does that fit into? Um, if you're an employer or an industry, how do you find the time for that young person to come in? Uh, and equally, where, yeah, so where are these people going to come from? Which I, I find that quite difficult to, to understand. And also, you know, students going in to get work experience, having said, mentioned earlier and seen a few things on here, uh, the MedSmarter and uh, the FOBME thing is, the students have a lot more to offer, I genuinely believe, than just getting experience. You know, I'd rather it be a, you know, a student sort of planted in to try and disrupt what's already happening. Um, and although that might sound, you know, a bit far-fetched and, you know, not likely to happen, I, I do genuinely believe that um, you can learn a lot from a student. Um, and the days of going in and sweeping the floor and making cups and tea and coffee for a couple of weeks are long gone. I think we can learn a lot from students. Yeah. I think that maybe leads on to the, uh, the aspect of reverse mentoring as well that seems to be kind of uh, getting a, a lot of m momentum as well so that we're actually coming the other way with mentoring as well, and that uh, should work so what, both what, what ways. What's reverse mentoring? Talk, talk us through that. So again, uh, I know that uh, Dell uh, operate this uh, this type of uh, uh, methodology in that, so the new graduates coming in are, are teamed with uh, someone who's been in the organization for longer. Uh, so the mentoring works in, in the reverse order in that traditionally, I guess you would be assigned uh, a mentor who's been in the organization for, for a longer period of time. So it, it should work both ways. Of then their skills being kind of you know, uh, transferred maybe to the, uh, to the person who's been there for longer. Um, and I guess the other point is in, in Prince City we have uh, uh, a student from one of the local colleges coming in. Uh, again, I think he, he comes in two or three times a week now yeah. um, uh, and does different jobs around the uh, uh, Prince City. But what we're starting to see now as well is that you know, he needs something for certain tasks, so he's actually designing it and printing it and using that tool to to help with some of the work he's he's doing while he's in there so so that aspect of coming in and actually seeing what ideas he has but allowing him to realize those ideas as well and I can sure. see you know I guess his vision and where he'll go in his career has probably changed a lot since coming in and even his confidence and things like that yeah. is growing you know, so. yeah his confidence definitely changed from when he first came in, he just kind of got on with little jobs and did what he was told to do. But as he's kind of learned from everybody else, he's been watching me and Ed and all the other team at Prince City, and he's kind of picked up on what we're doing, and he just takes ownership of things. And you go to do something, and he's already done it. And then I look over, and I find him talking to somebody who's come in to maybe inquire about the best way to 3D print, and he's confidently talking about all the technology at such a young age. Mm. So to have that opportunity so early on in his career, I think that's going to make a huge impact to where he where he gets to and where he wants to be. But then we, we need to take that now and understand how, how that works and how we can roll it out and, and, and impact more students in that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So interesting question. What are you doing to give students the edge as candidates as future engineers? I'm looking for real world experience within the job site. So yeah, I guess what's, what makes the difference between uh, you know, training that everybody gets and what, what can make somebody the real you know, so the next superstar? One thing we're doing, again, going back to the, uh, the industrial digitalization, I'm, I'm supervising three students uh, on that uh, course who are uh, working with a leading sports brand uh, around sports shoes. Um, so 
the difference uh, in, uh, in their approach to the project over the last three or four months has, uh, has been amazing and really in that uh, the level of focus it's given. So we've, uh, we've gone to their site in London, uh, met with their team. So, so traditionally where I might have brought the student along to a project like that and meet the, maybe the, the young engineer who's going to work alongside them and maybe one supervisor, uh, we had a team of around eight people come in and spend a full day with us talking about the product, the challenges that they have. Uh, and that gave inspiration to the students then of actually this project that I'm working on means something. Uh, there's a real need and we actually have something to offer here that uh, the, you know, there's technology that we have access to that the company doesn't. Uh, so we're actually uh, collaborating and actually it's a team effort rather than uh, maybe working on something that uh, just for the sake of doing a project. So. Uh, and then off the back of that, I guess we're seeing uh, that there are other skill sets required. Uh, so we're speaking to people from kind of a, a medical point of view who are dealing with uh, sports injuries. Uh, we're looking at kind of gate analysis technology and how that might, might help. Uh, and then we're looking from the business perspective and fashion and textiles. So all of that is starting to come together in this project that uh, started out with uh, maybe a focus in one area. Uh, so I think that's an example that, you know, uh, the students are studying at the moment, but it's a real life project. Uh, the company is really interested in the output of that, and it looks like they will engage on a much wider range of projects uh, following this. And it means that the students then, as they leave, uh, will have either have a, an opportunity there, or when it comes to interview time, will have a real live case study that they can actually talk about uh, and, uh, and hopefully secure, secure work. I can answer that about some real, wo real world experiences that I've had at Print City. So I've noticed the importance of having kind of a level, level playing field. So instead of having the lecturers and the managers and then you have the students, Print City works in the way that everybody's equal and we all bring new knowledge to the table. There's no kind of hierarchy. So when a company or an SME or somebody comes in with a problem or a project they'd like to work on, instead of going straight to the Print City designer, it's opened up to students because students have a lot of different ideas from different backgrounds because everybody's from a different area. But having the opportunity to work, to select the best students for that job, and it provides real world experience for a lot of students on the MSC course. I think most of us have had some kind of real world engagement through this. And I know myself, I've worked on research projects with the NHS. I've worked on some fully funded projects, I've had a lot of real world experience just from being in that environment where people come in and they don't kind of go straight over your head. You're in right from the beginning to have a chat with them to talk about it and we can also provide insights. There's been a lot of situations where people have come in and just had a chat with students and we have provided insights into what they can do and they've asked to work more with us directly. So yeah, having that level playing field and yeah. getting rid of the hierarchy. And that's mutual benefit then exactly. of, of every, everybody's yeah. learning <coughs> something and gaining something from that relationship. But Definitely. I think it's also breaking out of the traditional silos that we have. So normally if a company came in, they might meet the School of Engineering or you know, civil engineering or, or art uh, because we're, we're kind of opening up and going across faculty. Uh, I know that I can call on people in the business school or the fashion school uh, to come in and actually collaborate with us. Uh, so then it's, we're, I suppose, giving a better offering, a more kind of holistic offering as well in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think the other key thing that we're, we're looking at from an industry four perspective is the sustainability aspect of things as well. And I think I mentioned to you the other day around aligning what we're doing with the UN's 17 sustainable development goals yes, yes, and seeing smart. how industry four can have an impact on some of those. So whether it's ending poverty, uh, homelessness. So if we give people the digital skills, do we create more employment and, and help them? Uh, the impact that we can have on climate change, uh, you know, uh, the technology and the economic benefits as well. So, so that's an important aspect of what we're doing in our, our industry four journey and our, our focus as well. So I mean, it's often been uh, said that we have a problem with perception sometimes uh, uh, with, with bringing people into an industry. And you, you alluded earlier to the fact that digitalization in a way uh, might, might get over some of that in, in making it seem a bit more uh, interesting and then it's getting away from the, the old perception. But um, w where is the role for not only changing the perception that it's a subject that might be interesting, but w uh, for example, gender diversity has, has, has long been a problem. Um, uh, diversity in general, perhaps, uh, is also a problem. 
uh, and, and also creating um, enough interest because we've got uh, clearly an, an aging society, uh, a top, a top heavy aging workforce, lots of people coming up for retirement. I think I've read some statistic of something like 50% of, of, of engineering people will retire in the next 10 years, which is scary. So we need, <laughs> we need suddenly to fill the, the front end yeah. of that. Where, where's the responsibility and what, what initiatives are you aware of that, that are helping to address that? Did, I, did you want to maybe mention how many e the equality levels within the MSC? Uh, yes, so our MSC is about 50-50 male and female, which is fantastic. And again, for the schools that are coming in to work with us, for the people that we're managing to reach, it's set in a good stance of kind of, it's not this big industry, there's all men. It's kind of destroying some of the preconceptions that people mm -hmm. have when they think about industry four in this industry. And to me, it's just about providing inspiration. I mean, once you have some inspiration and you're inspired, you look for people in that area that can help you further. It's just on the outside, it's, it's making this more accessible and making it human-centered, if you like, and kind of open it up to, for everybody to understand. And I think that will have a huge impact on getting more gender diversity within the industry. Great. I, th I think that aspect as well of uh, the opening th that MSC up to, you know, kind of non-traditional backgrounds that might come to an MSC like that uh, has helped, I think. And uh, now that we've got the ball rolling with it, I think, you know, we can build on that and, and have, you know, positive stories around the opportunities that that has created for you guys mm -hmm. uh, to try and promote more of that uh, coming through. Uh, excellent. So uh, once again, the clock has beaten us. We've got lots more questions and we have, have time to, to answer. I'm uh, going to have to call an end to, to, to the session, unfortunately, but hopefully uh, you're around for, for today and, and probably tomorrow as well. You've got s all got stands out there as well. So uh, yeah, I think you'll find, yeah. Yeah, Manchester Met somewhere out there. There's, uh, we've got a few locations out there, so please come and yeah, talk to us over there. Super. Over there. Well, thank you all for your uh, your participation today. It's really really interesting. I think if you join me in uh, thanking uh, our panel.